Hi, everyone. Welcome back uh, for week seven, lecture two. Today will be a pretty short one, a half hour or less I'm shooting for, um, covering a little bit of uh, the stuff that we've covered in the textbook, but then uh, also taking my spin on Islamic faith, art, and science. Uh, in particular, I'm going to be looking at kind of the interplay between art and mathematics in the Islamic world and the Islamic empire. Um, we're going to review the Islamic belief system just really briefly, kind of the five pillars of Islam, which the book also covers. Um, we're going to talk about the Islamic empire in its uh, three caliphates, three initial caliphates. Uh, look at Islamic mathematics, which are still quite significant today. And in reality, all of us in doing math are using at least some parts, uh, major parts of Islamic math. Um, and as I said, we're going to do geometry and Islamic art, which I think is very interesting and very fun. Um, and then look very briefly at some Silk Road connections. We'll have more on this a little bit later uh, in the term, especially as we get to uh, later periods in China. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and get myself out of the way here. And I want to start with this image. This is one of the domes in the Hagia Sophia um, in Istanbul or Constantinople, as it was previously known. Um, and uh, there's an interesting article here from the Paris Review on the Hagia Sophia over time. Um, and we can see that in 1453, which is really after the period that we're studying today and that the book is talking about, Mehmed II and his army finally conquered uh, Istanbul or, or conquered Constantinople, and, and it would change in its name to Istanbul, and marched on the Hagia Sophia, which was kind of a central goal a uh, place to, to get to this great Christian uh, church and conquer it. Mehmed dismounted at the door of the church and bent down to take a handful of earth, which he then sprinkled over his turban as an act of humility before God. Uh, because as we know, the Christian God and the Islamic God are the same God, right? Uh, so entering a Christian church for him was a, a place of worship from a different group of people for the same God. And in the five centuries following that symbolic act of putting the sand over his turban, um, the greatest religious building of the Ottoman Empire, uh, which was essentially being founded at that time in 1453, um, it was a continuing uh, important place, but now it's shown as a mosque rather than as a Christian church. So it's now an imperial mosque. Um, and it was expanded and built up over time. And here we see one of the new domes of the Hagia Sophia, which is inscribed with uh, Arabic uh, symbology, Arabic writing um, at the top of its dome, where previously uh, there might have been Christian symbols and Christian symbology and imagery of Christ or Mary, etc. cetera. Um, so I wanted to start with that as an opening introduction today to the Islamic Empire, uh, which I'll review kind of briefly here. Um, the book goes over this in a lot of detail. I'm having you read, I think, 30 plus pages about this, so I'm not going to do all the same things the book does. But uh, the three caliphates you should try to be aware of, um, maybe not remember, but you should know something about these, um, is the Rashidun Caliphate, which is the first caliphate after the death of Muhammad. It is this new established, um, you could call it a government or a polity um, that is meant to carry on the expansion of the Islamic faith and the Islamic state, which are kind of linked together. Um, and this lasts for about 30 years. It is then overthrown by the, or replaced by the Umayyad Caliphate, um, which lasts for about 90 years and sees a major expansion. So the Rashidun Caliphate, if you can see my mouse, basically covers the areas here that we see in light green and orange on the top right and the middle of this map. That's roughly the area of the Rashidun Caliphate. And the Umayyad Caliphate, the second of these great first three great caliphates, sees significant expansion into North Africa, um, across to Morocco, and then into Spain, covering most of the Iberian Peninsula, most of Spain. Um, and then the Abbasid Caliphate sees a consolidation. It doesn't really expand the empire in terms of its size all that much, uh, but it is 
more the establishment of a firm bureaucracy to manage the empire. And we see that this bureaucracy of the Abbasid, this map is of the Abbasid Caliphate, uh, includes kind of subcategories within this caliphate um, and the regions of this caliphate that were basically controlled by different um, Abbasid uh, uh, subordinate states. Um, I think this map is very interesting. Uh, this is a map of Baghdad between uh, about 150 and 300. Um, and it shows that this is a circular city and this is the new capital city after the death of Muhammad for the Islamic uh, empire. Um, right here, obviously lo located in modern Iraq. Um, and what is a caliphate? A caliphate is a combined religious political uh, state under uh, the Islamic faith. Um, and you can read about it. I have lots of links here you can look at. Some of them are to our now well-known ancient encyclopedia. Some are to other uh, encyclopedias. Um, but throughout this lecture, as always, there are lots of links to read more about these things. But I do want to keep this short. So I'm, I'm moving right along today. Um, Islam, uh, the, the faith itself as a religion, is um, broken down uh, fairly cleanly into five pillars or five separate areas of belief. These are Shahada, the Creed, Salat, prayer, Psalm, fasting, Hajj or pilgrimage and zakat or alms giving, giving. Although actually, usually the way this is uh, recited is that zakat is in the middle and Hajj is the last one. Um, and anyway, I'm going to talk about these a little bit more in a second. Um, like I said, Islam shares the same God with both Judaism and Christianity, but approaches worship and conversation about that God, about Allah, very differently. Um, it kind of has its own set of rules and regulations about these things. And these five pillars uh, tell you about the rules. You can look at each one of these. The BBC has uh, a pretty decent little website that here I'll click some of these. Uh, it gives you a little bit more of a definition of these things, not a huge definition. And I'll uh, let's go ahead and make this not full screen uh, so we can look at those. Um, and I've given you links to each of those, but Shahada is the recitation of this creed of there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah or the prophet of Allah. Um, it is important in particular when thinking about Shahada to remember that Muhammad is not a God. Uh, Muhammad is a prophet, um, and, and God is known only as God. He does not have a separate name or a separate representation on earth. So this is very different from Christianity, which sees Jesus as the human embodiment of God. Um, Allah is not that way uh, with Muhammad. Uh, so th it is a different relationship between this prophet and the God who is Allah is formless. Uh, he is kind of timeless. And uh, so you cannot represent him. And we'll talk about this in uh, another minute or two, a couple more slides, I think. Salat is a, a prayer conducted five times a daily. Uh, you may be familiar with this. Uh, people here in New York do it. Um, and you, you face Mecca if uh, you're able to. You orient yourself towards Mecca uh, or you do it at Mecca, ideally. Um, it's also ideal to do it in a congregation at a mosque with, uh, with a priest in front of you, or you can do it by yourself if needed. And so sometimes you may see people at their workplaces getting out a prayer rug, facing towards uh, Mecca and praying five times a day. In the Islamic world, there will often be a call to prayer that you will hear audibly throughout the city uh, or throughout your town. And so you'll know it is time to pray uh, these five times. Zakat um, is uh, giving a part of one's wealth or income to charity. And I don't know that this started initially at 2.5%. I'm not sure about this, but today it is kind of a fixed rate of 2.5% of your wealth or your income is given to charity. Um, Psalm is a holy month of fasting or it's fasting in general, but the most famous of these is Ramadan which lasts from sunrise to sunset each day for a month. And this is based on the lunar calendar. Um, the Hajj um, is a pilgrimage to Mecca, meaning you go physically to Mecca and you go to this, uh, this holy site, which is built all around the Kaaba, uh, which is um, 
you can, you can read about it here, which is the holiest site in the Islamic faith. You're supposed to do this yearly, ideally, although obviously this is kind of impractical uh, for some people, especially today. Um, you know, if you live in the United States, it's, it's probably not practical for everyone to go to uh, Mecca every year. Um, but you should at least try to do it once in your life, as kind of uh, as a, a ground rule. Um, and I think this is a nice definition of the Kaaba from the David collection, which I believe is... Uh, I'm not sure where it's from. It's, it's a, uh, from Denmark. It's this museum from Denmark that has a nice little definition of the Kaaba here. Um, in the Quran, the Kaaba is understood as the house of both God and Abraham. According to the Quran, Abraham, who is Islam's first prophet, and his son Ishmael built a house of stones from the time of Adam exactly on this site. Both the Kaaba's location and its physical form are thus closely linked with the first man that God created on earth and with Abraham, the founding father of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, sorry about the noise in the background. Um, so Islamic arts and science, uh, alongside the Islamic faith, an empire uh, kind of expanded around it. And this is what chapter 10 is all about. You can read all about it in chapter 10. This expansion quickly saw the development of Islamic culture outside of religion, including art and the sciences. Um, and rather famously, Islam forbids any depiction of God, uh, right? And I said this a second ago, but you're not supposed to draw a picture of God or have uh, any kind of an artistic image of God, which is different from Christianity, for example. You see images of God on things like the Sistine Chapel, etc. You see them kind of all over the place. Um, this is not something you're supposed to do in the Islamic faith. And as a result of that, we see things like calligraphic art become quite popular. So uh, I've answered my question here, which is that one way to represent God is then through writing, through language. You're not actually trying to draw the form of this perfect deity, um, but you are still conveying the message about this deity and about its perfection through calligraphic art. Uh, that is art that it uses calligraphy and writing to represent itself. Um, so that's one kind of Islamic art that we see a lot. And another kind that we see a lot has to do with the science and mathematics. So I want to talk about Islamic math for a minute here. Um, and many Arabic terms are still used in describing math today, and they've been adopted from Arabic and from the Islamic world. Um, I'll try to get this name right. I apologize. Uh, you know, I, I speak Japanese, uh, not Arabic, so this is a tough one. Muhammad Ibn Musa al Khwarizmi. Um, that's my best rendering of this name. Um, is a famous mathematician who lived from about 780 to about 847, and he's one of the principal actors who spread Arabic mathematics to the West. This happened largely through Italian merchants he was interacting with or, uh, you know, discussing the system with. And Italian merchants uh, really latched on to the mathematical teachings of uh, this person and some others um, and eventually abandoned the abacus in favor of this new decimal system of notation that was being brought to them by Arab traders and by Arab mathematicians. Um, He's also noted for revolutionizing quadratic equations. Um, and in the title of his book on quadratic equations is the word algebra. Uh, and that's where we get the term for algebra. And so this is one page from his book uh, on uh, quadratic equations, and which brings us algebra. The symbol X, which we use all the time in algebra to represent a uh, unknown uh, factor, you know, un unknown element in an equation, also comes uh, from Arabic. It originates through Arabic, and I believe it comes through the French who uh, translate it, and it turns up as X. Um, the modern usage of uh, Arabic numerals is also quite important. Um, if you're ever writing uh, down numbers these days, generally you're actually technically writing them in a Hindu Arabic script. Um, so these numbers come originally from India, and they're popularized in the Arab world in the Islamic empire. Um, and uh, 
they are a base 10 system, which is something that you see in other places. The base 10 system may be as old as humanity itself. You know, we have 10 fingers, so you can count on them, and that's a base 10 system. But this more complex high-level math based on a base 10 system originates in India and then is kind of perfected in the Islamic empire, uh, in the Arab world, and uh, it is now in use everywhere on Earth. That this base 10 system is the most common form of mathematical notation or mathematical writing. And we generally do it using uh, Arabic numerals um, or Hindu Arabic numerals, if you want to be quite technical. Um, and so this decimal system is very convenient, right? Uh, and this is recognized early on by some of the Europeans, uh, initially the Italians that are interacting with uh, Arabic traders. Because if you're trying to write down a number in Roman numerals, I'm sure you've all had to do this once or twice in school, um, it's kind of a pain. Uh, it's, it's not easy. It's not simple. It's not quick to understand. And just to compare a couple of numbers here uh, on the bottom left, I think it's just good to have this right here. You know, 1975 is a pretty easy number to write out in Arabic numerals, but in Roman it is MCMLXXV. And there's a lot of thinking you have to do to do that uh, and, you know, to do it quickly. So uh, this base 10 system is adopted essentially because it's way more efficient, uh, way easier to use. More people can learn it. More people can be accurate with it than you could with the previous system of numerals that was in use in this kind of Mediterranean sphere, which is all based on Roman numerals, which we still use today for a few things. But Arabic numerals have, have obviously taken over and they're the ones we use the most. Um, so another thing that comes out of, uh, you know, Islamic math or Arabic math, um, is the use of geometry in Islamic art. And this is really fascinating to me. I think it's very beautiful. Um, but it's, it's also quite captivating to look at some of these patterns and there is almost a meditative element to these, to looking at, uh, the patterns in some Islamic art. Um, we see a lot of, uh, circles and squares and uh, other shapes, triangles represented in very intricate patterns that are built on top of each other. And there is a lot of mathematics behind the creation of this art, right? And I think this, um, this diagram on the right is quite good. Uh, I'll go ahead and read this to you. In Islamic art, the geometric figure of the circle represents the primordial symbol of unity and the ultimate source of all diversity in creation. The natural division of the circle into regular divisions is the ritual starting point for many traditional Islamic patterns, as demonstrated in the drawings below. So these drawings are quite interesting in that they lay out kind of what this kind of tiling, which is based on a very old uh, you know, practice of using intricate tiling that was used by the Greeks and Romans, um, but is done so in a more intricate and more geometric way uh, by, you know, Arabic tile workers um, than ever before. And it is often seen in religious buildings, in mosques, that you'll find a lot of this really intricate tile work. And so there's a reason for this in that it connects to the universe. And so there's a lot of philosophical and religious belief behind the reasons for these patterns. We see it in common everyday objects. This is a bowl. Uh, this is a chest, um, and there are, is an entire uh, Met uh, article with lots of lots of examples, a, a short article, but lots of examples here on the Met of some of this Islamic uh, pattern, geographic pattern art. Um, you see it in rugs quite a lot too. If you've ever looked at uh, a carpet or rug from the Arab world, uh, you see a lot of these interesting patterns, geometrical uh, patterns on them. So I wanted to talk about that just really briefly. And then to wrap up today, I'm trying to go quick here, make this as short as possible. We also see uh, an, incre an increased trade in artistry and uh, artistic objects between uh, East and West through um, the collaboration of the Islamic Empire and the Chinese Empire uh, in particular. So blue and white porcelain is a really good embodiment of this. Uh, by around the turn of the second century CE, by around the year 1000, um, we start to see blue and white pottery becoming popular in both China and the West, um, the Islamic world, um, and in Europe increasingly over time. Uh, and the 
use uh, the creation of this pottery itself is dependent on the Silk Road. Okay, and here's why. So the pottery comes from China, and Chinese pottery, I mean, literally China, you've heard of this term as, you know, the China that you have in your kitchen, if you have some nice dishes, um, comes from China and is wildly popular in the rest of the world, in, in both the Middle East and Europe, um, and uh, the, the rest of the, I guess, the Western world. Um, and uh, the creation of blue and white pottery is the result of trade with the Islamic empire of cobalt, because this blue color that you see in blue and white uh, pottery does not exist in China. You're not able to make it in this kind of vibrant popping blue imagery uh, that you see in things like Ming vases. You, you probably heard it's, it's almost a, you know, a cultural trope to talk about Ming vases as a symbol of the rich and uh, wealthy people of, of the Western world. They have a Ming vase in their house. Um, and these pieces of blue and white pottery are created by the combination of Chinese uh, porcelain with uh, Arabic cobalt, which is imported to China and then used to, cre to create this dye or this pigment that is then applied to all kinds of things, uh, but blue and white pottery being the most famous. So this starts happening in the Song Dynasty. Uh, it, it's often you know, considered to be a Ming Dynasty thing, but it's actually several hundred years earlier that it starts to happen in the Song Dynasty. Here's a whole book about it, uh, which I have not read, but I thought it was a good looking cover. Um, but it is a, uh, you know, a reasonably scholarly book about the blue and white porcelain of the Song Dynasty, um, which we'll talk about once again later in the term. But this connection of cobalt on the Silk Road is the combination of the rising Islamic empire and the kind of thriving Chinese empire connecting across very long distances of desert and water. Um, so that's it for today. I'm going to wrap, uh, wrap this up for today. This is our last uh, substantive lecture before your object paper is due. I've decided, and I think I've already sent you an announcement about this, but I've decided that if you want to take until Sunday instead of having the uh, the paper be due on the 28th, I'll give you a few extra days. If you want to have it in by the 3rd, that's fine. Uh, that means it will be due on the same day as your current short response, short response number four. Um, but uh, as long as you've gotten me the image of your object and the museum label, at least a draft of the museum label uh, by the 28th, that's fine because then I can make that lecture about uh, your museum. Um, if I don't get enough of those in time, that lecture could be slightly delayed, but I hope not. Um, and I do think because of the difficulties of this term and everyone having kind of crazy schedules and lots of busy things happening with, uh, you know, this, this problem we're having with coronavirus, um, it is a good idea to give you officially a few extra days here. And please let me know if you're having trouble and, you know, if, if you need a short extension, we can work together on that uh, if you have a valid reason for that. As many as, uh, of you as possible, please do try to stay on track and try to get me this essay on time by the third at the latest, um, just so that you're able to keep up with the course. That's my main concern with that. Uh, I don't want too many people falling behind because by the end of the course, at the end of the term, you need to be done with everything uh, so that I can give you a grade, right? Because if, if you're not finished with things at the end of the term, you're just going to get a zero on them. So I'm, I'm hoping everyone is keeping up reasonably well, and I am flexible on these due dates, but try to get it to me by the third if you can, if you're not too uh, burdened with other things, you know, helping family members or work. Um, but I am going to give you that extension till the third. And then next time, the next video I put up will probably be this student museum overview, uh, unless there aren't enough submissions, in which case I'll, I'll delay that one a little bit. All right, uh, everyone have a good weekend. I'm looking forward to reading uh, about your objects and seeing what you have picked. Um, and you know, let me know if you have any questions about that. Be sure to look at the old lectures. I have two lectures from week four and five about working on that object paper, as well as a sample paper on, uh, on our Google Drive folder that you can look at if you need to understand how to write this paper a bit better. All right, uh, I will see you next time.